It is an absolute pleasure to be introducing Daniela Fernandez tonight. I met Daniela uh, just under a year ago when she had her first gala here at the Academy, and I've been so impressed with her since then. So I want to start with a question. I want you to think back to when you were 19. There shouldn't be any of you who are 19 in here, by the way, because it's 21 and older. But let's just all think back to when you were 19. All right, you got it in your mind? I know. For some of us, it was a while ago. But when you were 19, what were you doing? Because this woman over here was starting a bit of a revolution. She was starting the Sustainable Ocean Alliance from her dorm room at Georgetown University. Yes, we should definitely clap for that. Okay, fast forward five years later, five years after the dorm room experience, Daniela has built the Sustainable Ocean Alliance into a global organization that is cultivating and accelerating innovative solutions that protect and sustain the health of our ocean. With phenomenal speed, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance has created the world's largest network of young ocean leaders through establishing a presence in over 135 countries and launching the world's first ocean solutions accelerator to develop technological solutions that address the greatest threats facing our planet. I am deeply energized and inspired by the important work that Daniela is doing all around our planet. Please join me in welcoming tonight's esteemed speaker, Daniela Fernandez. Take a hug. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you all for being here. I know that you could be out there partying with the silent disco, but instead you've chosen to learn about the ocean and the environment. So, And what better place to be here than the Cal Academy? So I'll give it a hand for the Cal Academy for Elizabeth, please. So I like to tell you a story today. And that story is the story of my journey and what led me to be standing before you today. When I was 12 years old, I saw All Girls Moving in Convenient Truth. How many of you have seen the movie? Raise your hand. Okay, if you haven't seen it, please go home after this and watch it. Um, I think it was one of the films that completely changed the way that humanity approached climate change. And for many of us, when we were young, we were told, you know, the sky's the limit. We were told, you know, go have fun, play with your friends. But our parents shield us in this crystal world. And for me, that crystal world came shattering down when I saw this movie. And when this man told me that the environment was going to be destructed, when he showed us how much our climate was being destroyed, how our species were being harmed, and how humans would also suffer the consequences of climate change. And so for me, when I was 12 years old, I saw this movie and I was heartbroken. That same day I realized that it was my responsibility to do something to help protect our environment. Of course, I had no idea what that was, as many, you know, I guess like tweens kind of have a passion and want to do something, but you never know what it is that you can do to protect the environment. So I spent my entire uh, educational career throughout elementary school and high school finding, looking for that passion, looking for the thing I could do. I raised some money for solar panels for my high school, which I'm happy to say they're still there. Um, I you know, helped fundraise for environmental awareness, but everything I did wasn't enough. And so it was when I ended up at Georgetown University, and th the reason why I went to Georgetown was because I wanted to run for office. And I thought that changing environmental policy was a silver bullet that will help everything. But when I went to Georgetown and I started talking to some politicians, I realized that policy wasn't moving the needle fast enough. And so then Georgetown gave me the opportunity to attend this meeting at the UN. So again, back to Elizabeth's point, I was 19 years old, sitting in this room, surrounded by heads of state and ambassadors and these amazing people around me, feeling totally out of place and feeling as if I didn't belong. But yet, I found out some very interesting statistics, and I want to share those with you today. Before I tell you the first one, I want all of us to do an exercise together. So close your eyes. 
quickly close your eyes. Okay. And take two deep breaths. Take the first one. One. And then take a second deep breath. Two. That second breath you took came from the ocean. 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean. And that's something that I learned while I was sitting at that UN meeting. Before, while I was in, in high school, I was told, plant trees and that will help study the environment. But no one told me the importance of the ocean. More so than that, the ocean also is a primary source of protein for three billion people in this world. Once we lose our fish, three billion people will be affected by malnutrition. More than that, the ocean also contributes to $3.4 trillion of the global economy. And that constitutes everything from, uh, from local tourism to fisheries. And so when we think about the role the ocean plays, it's not just about going to the beach, but it's all of these statistics that I learned during this meeting at the UN. And so then I started thinking about the importance of the ocean and you know, how I could think about it you know, like looking back at my background. And something that many people didn't know back then is that I was actually born in Ecuador. And I came to the US when I was five. So I didn't spend a lot of time in Ecuador. However, I started to wonder about the importance of the Galapagos, this incredible archipelago island that was such an important discovery you know, back in the day when we learned about you know, Charles Darwin. And so I started to, to ask some questions and try to figure out you know, how important is this environment. In order for us to think about the future of the Galapagos, who has been there, by the way? A raise of hand. OK, great. Who wants to go? <laughs> awesome. I hope everyone's hands are up. So when I started thinking about the importance of this planet, I learned that back in 1982, warm temperatures called El Nino destroyed nearly all of the animals up here. Sea turtles stopped hatching. Eight out of 10 penguin species completely they were just gone. And so when you think about how climate is changing and how our temperatures are warming, you look at this island, it's heartbreaking to think that all these species that you're looking at right here could be extinct someday. And that our children and our grandchildren will never get to see them. Let's also talk about ocean acidification. Who has heard of this term before, just out of curiosity? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for learning about the ocean. So what this means is, if you look at the two pictures of before and after, one picture shows you coral reefs in their prime state. And the other picture shows you what happens when our ocean absorbs carbon. And our ocean needs a specific pH level for it to be healthy and for it to be thriving. And the after picture shows you what happens when there is too much acidity and carbon in the ocean. This is what our future looks like. And this is what brings tears to my eyes and just thinking about the future we're inheriting. And let's talk about plastic pollution. Every single person in this room contributes to this problem. The lifespan of a plastic bag when you go into a grocery store and shop is 12 minutes but it lasts anywhere between 10 to 1,000 years in the ocean. Just think about that. That straw you use, that plastic utensil that is just so convenient for you to pick up and you know, eat your yogurt and then throw it away, it might end up in the ocean. And of course, that's one plastic straw, but then it breaks down and those become microplastics. By 2050, we're gonna have more plastic than fish by weight in the ocean. Forget about snorkeling and forget about scuba diving. You'll be snorkeling in a plastic soup instead of snorkeling with these wildlife creatures. And so I hope that you're feeling what I was feeling <laughs> while I was at this meeting at the UN. And as I was listening to all of these statistics and feeling frustration and anger and feeling just a sense of hopelessness, I learned that we don't have any more time. We have about 12 years to make a change in our environment before it's too late. 
I felt a need to act. I felt as if I had the responsibility to do something. But going back to me leaving that meeting at the UN, I had two major takeaways. The first takeaway was that I was the only young person in the room. Like I mentioned to you, I was surrounded by incredible people. Again, ambassadors, heads of state, NGO leaders, but they were all older. And our generation was inheriting that future, but our generation wasn't there to speak for ourselves. And that was a problem. Because if we have decision makers making decisions for the consequences that we're inheriting, that's just not fair. My second takeaway from that meeting at the UN was that everyone was talking about the problem, depressing you as I just did. <laughs> and no one was talking about solutions. No one was talking about hope. And that's what I wanted to get out of that meeting. I wanted to feel hopeful. I wanted to feel as if I could leave that room and do something with my life, do something with my community. And so I asked myself, why aren't we using technology? Why aren't we using ideas and innovation to make a difference in, the, in this space? And so on the train ride back from Georgetown, I realized that what if I could build a platform to bring these two worlds together? to bring young people from all over the world, and to bring these incredible heads of state and individuals together to talk to one another. Because all of these meetings were taking place behind closed doors. And so I built a platform called Sustainable Ocean Alliance with that vision of educating young people globally about the ocean's biggest problems, but also giving them an opportunity to act. A lot of nonprofits go out there and say, this is exactly what you need to do. Sign this petition. You know, do this, this, this action. But no one asks young people, what are you passionate about? What is your project and how can we help you? And so that's what I was hoping to do with SOA. I wanted to create a platform and give toolkits to young people to do something about the environmental challenges we're facing. And so five years after I founded SOA, we now have a global network of young people working in over 135 countries on the ground, planting coral reefs, building educational awareness about the ocean, trying to get marine protected areas off the ground, and truly taking ownership of this problem. Because it's not about pointing the finger to corporations or to governments and saying, we need to elect the next politician, which we obviously need new political leadership, I think we all could agree on that. But it's also about looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, what are we doing? How are our actions affecting the environment? So this is what SOA has become now. And of course, in addition to this community, we wanted to build an ecosystem for change, for innovation. And so we built the Ocean Solutions Accelerator, a platform where we could help entrepreneurs that have amazing ideas, give them mentorship, give them access to funding, give them access to the greatest minds of Silicon Valley, to help them take their ideas and bring them to life. Some examples of these companies are, which will fascinate you, one is called Lollyware. Lollyware is creating straws out of seaweed. So when you think about it, instead of having your straw last for a thousand years in the ocean and being choked by a sea turtle, these straws made out of seaweed, they last 18 hours and you can eat them. It's amazing. And this was created by a young entrepreneur out of New York. She went on Shark Tank, she got an investment by Mark Cuban. She's an amazing entrepreneur, but she needed that extra bit of help those partnerships, that mentorship, that access to funding that we could provide for her. Another company I want to talk about is Safety Net Technologies. So imagine half of the room here, you guys love red lights, you guys love yellow lights, and you're fish. So this company created electromechanical devices, it's called them flashlights, and attached them to fishing nets. So fish see light differently. And so half of you will swim away from this red light and half of you will swim towards this yellow light. And so by changing the wavelength of these lights, this company can decrease the catch of the wrong fish by 90%, which is amazing because you will, you'll, will no longer be able to capture turtles and dolphins 
and these species that aren't necessarily supposed to be caught in these fishing nets. And this is what the future looks like. We don't have to harm our environment to do good. It's a design flaw. When you think about business models that have been created in the past, they've always been thought about the bottom line of making profit. But you've never thought about them in a way of being sustainable, being in harmony with the environment. But I have to say that I would argue that our generation can make that happen. We can make business models that can provide support and help towards the environment. And so, of course, we had these five companies last year, but at Davos we announced that by the year 2021, in three years, SOA has pledged to accelerate 100 ocean tech companies. And what does that mean? That means that we need to find these amazing young ocean entrepreneurs. We will nourish their ideas, provide them with funding and support, and provide the right infrastructure to make sure they're successful. Because we can only survive in this planet if our ocean survives. And the way to get there is by making sure we support innovation. And so I'm hoping that by now you're wondering, what can you do? Because again, this isn't just about helping entrepreneurs or helping companies, but it's about also looking at ourselves and asking, how are your actions contributing to the environment or damaging it in that sense? So the first thing that you can do is become educated. The fact that you're already sitting here means a lot because you want to learn more about this problem. We released the State of the Ocean Report at Davos, and I would encourage all of you to take a look at it and read it. But also, there are so many amazing videos and documentaries out there, such as David Attenborough's uh, Our Planet series. How many of you have seen that? OK. Go home and binge watch that. It's amazing. You'll get to see what the pristine life for a planet looks like and what's at stake of being lost. I would also encourage you, if you're a young person that wants to get involved and join our community, become a young ocean leader. No matter what your passion is, if you're into the arts, or if you're into fashion or finance, we can use your help. The world can use your help. Or if someone in here is an ocean entrepreneur, we would encourage you to apply to a program or become a mentor to help support our other ocean entrepreneurs that we'll be supporting this year during our program. And so what I want to leave you with today is the importance of taking responsibility for our actions. When I was 19, I thought that I was going to go into finance or, or become a politician someday. And I had a really hard decision to make as I was crossing that graduation stage. I had been offered many jobs in Wall Street, and I could have taken them because that was the stable thing to do and you know the, the smart thing to do, many people told me. But instead, I crossed my graduation stage with no funding for my nonprofit, having turned on all my job offers, because I knew that I had the responsibility to do something for our planet. I knew that the urgency exists, and if I didn't do something today, I would regret it for the rest of my life. And so I hope that you leave here today asking yourselves, what can you do? Because to quote Margaret Mead, it only takes a small group of people to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll take some questions now, if anyone's interested in asking anything. Should they go up here? Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. I'm a landlord in San Francisco, and I manage a number of buildings. And I never get more angry than when I check the garbage bins, and they are not sorted correctly. How you are preaching to the choir. Do you have any idea 
on how to make young people care. Yeah, I, I don't think that young people don't care. I think that the whole infrastructure around recycling, the system is broken. China recently completely banned us from sending our recycling to their country. And so now we're in a place where only 9% of recyclables get recycled. The rest end up in the ocean or are burned. And when you think about that, it's a complete disaster. So we have to figure out how can we put pressure on our politicians, on our city councils to figure out a way to completely restructure the, this waste system. And also figure out innovative ways. I mean, who is he in here as a marketer? How can we make recycling fun and instructive? So it's a matter of both having the right infrastructure system that we currently don't have. I think the entire world is struggling with that. And also making sure that we can make it easier for people to know what is to recycle and what, what is not to recycle. Who here knows the number system of the recycling? The one, two, three, the five, six, seven? Raise your hand if you actually know it. I see maybe five hands up. And I think that's a problem, right? We have to educate people as to like what goes into recycling bin and what doesn't and also create a new system of infrastructure for recycling. Yeah. Who here cares about recycling? Yeah, I, I think people care. It's just not easy to recycle, and that's what we have to change. Any other and I'm going to actually jump in, Daniela. Please this do. is the voice of God over here on the side. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to say, you know, one of the things that inspires me so much about you and the entrepreneurs is that recycling is not the answer, right? How many of us remember reduce, reuse, recycle, right? That's in that order for a particular reason because recycling is the last resort. Really, we gotta go up that chain and before reduce, yeah, thank you for the clapping on that one. <laughs> we, gotta get, we gotta hit refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? And so, and what your entrepreneurs are doing is they're reinventing the way that we interact with stuff. Right, and we're, we're rethinking what stuff is in our life, what we need, what we don't, and what those materials are, and just huge kudos to you for like breaking that mold and not thinking that recycling is the answer. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any other questions? I have a question down here. <laughs> um, so I my name is Rachel, and I live over in Sausalito. And I actually live in a unique community where we live on the water. Um, and I wanted to know, because I feel like we have a very eclectic group of people. And one of the things that I've struggled with is like, what are the proper products to use? Because a lot of people don't have filtration systems. And if we're dealing with people not having filtration systems and directly going into the ocean, is there any like products or anything you know of? Because that would help because I just feel like so many people directly pollute into the system and it's just very upsetting to see. And I'm kind of trying to start shifting that little community to be more responsible. Tell me more about what you mean by the, um, the things that are end up in the ocean, like what? From shower products, yeah, gray water mainly, uh, shower sinks. Uh, luckily we've switched everybody over where everybody's already using just where we have it pretty much like a trailer park where everybody gets their tanks filled around and nobody's dumping waste anymore directly. But it's mainly just like, you know, people dump food directly into the ocean. They just dump whatever's in their sink down into the drain and directly down as well as dishwashing soaps and stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's definitely, there's no filtration system that exists right now. Um, and the other big pollutant that happens is your clothes have microfibers that also end up in the ocean. So every time you wash your clothes without knowing it, you're polluting the ocean, right? And again, it's not something that we inherently want to do, but there's no alternative to it. So how easy would it be to create a new washing machine that had a filter that would capture all these microfibers? But the problem is it doesn't exist, right? So who in here is going to go and build it? <laughs> That's the next question that I would have, right? Um, and I would say, you know, everything from like natural products, I think that our generation specifically um, is more inclined to pay a little bit more money for a sustainable brand, for brands that are actually doing good for the environment, which is an amazing mind shift, right? Because nine out of 10 millennials in the survey that was done by Deloitte show that we care more about our employers, like what their values are, like how are we investing money, how are we investing our time into the space. So I think it's truly about that, that mind shift, right, and finding alternatives because we can't just keep people from doing something, we can't just 
you know, keep them away from a product, but we have to give them that, that replacement. So I say it doesn't exist, so you should definitely like go do a challenge, right? It's like, let's build this filter system and we can help you with that. So thank you for your question. Anyone else? Here. Okay, we've got one more and I'm <laughs> gonna run and not, not die. Here we go. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that amazing presentation. There was a map that you showed in your presentation, which I believe was about the SOA chapters mm -hmm. globally. And I noticed a lot of uh, dots on that map that were significantly far away from an ocean or a water body. And I was just curious to learn more about what those, uh, as a person that did not grow up anywhere near the water, quite far away from any uh, place that would be considered a water body, I'm curious to learn more about how those chapters are influencing our environment even though they might not be directly interacting with the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that I love the most about SOA is the fact that we have young people who, you know, may live in like a, you know, inland neighborhood and are just passionate about the ocean and want to do something. So one of the things they're doing is creating ocean curriculum for their own universities and high schools to make sure that they can educate more people about the importance of the ocean. I mean, even the, the breeding exercise that we did, right? Like half of you didn't know that oxygen was a primary source that came from the, from the ocean. And so making sure that we make more people aware of like why these problems exist and why it's such an important issue. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the major pollutants of plastic waste in the ocean are 10 rivers. And so when you think about, it's not just coastal areas that are suffering from pollution, but it's these 10 rivers. Eight of them are in Asia and two of them are in Africa. So we have a lot of chapters that are working like locally to figure out how to stop the, the local waste that's happening in the rivers. Even though they're not close to the ocean, they're trying to stop the river streams from ending up um, in the ocean being pollutants. Absolutely. Do we have time for one more? I think we are at time right okay. now, but if you want to chat with Daniela, um, come on down afterwards. And for those of you, thank you for taking time out of Party After Dark to come and learn from fantastic Daniela. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.